House Church. Welcome back once again to a space where we challenge each other to grow and to become more like Jesus. Um, thank you for joining us. I want to add one more announcement to what you've already heard today. Like Cheryl mentioned, we have our Christmas party happening in the Winkler area next week. And then the week after that, on December 17, we're back in House Church. We'll be diving into part four of our Rooted and Gifted series. This is possibly going to be the wrap up of our series. Then we go on our Christmas break. And so there is no organized service or house church on December 24th on uh, Christmas Eve. And there'll be nothing either on December 31st on New Year's Eve. And then we're still on a break on January 7th. And then we get back into things on January 14th. We'll be starting the new year with a brand new series. Um, we're working on putting that together right now. Um, January 14th is going to be a house church week. And so we have three weeks there where we have a little bit of a break. I really encourage you um, to take time to reach out to one another. Uh, just because there isn't something organized doesn't mean we don't connect with each other. So call each other, message each other, uh, find ways to connect. Like find someone to have over for dinner. Maybe try and connect with someone from um, the church community that you haven't really had a chance to really get to know quite a bit yet. Invite them over this holiday season. Maybe play some games, do something fun together. But let's be intentional. That's one of our core values is intentional with our relationship with God and then with each other as well. Let's be intentional about creating space for relationship. I do want to recognize and acknowledge that the holiday season can be tough. Um, it's supposed to be moments filled with joy and with community and with family. But I recognize that sometimes the holiday season can be difficult, especially if you're experiencing grief or loss. You know, if this is your first year um, experiencing Christmas without a specific loved one, if you're just actually in a season of your life where you're feeling lonely, um, then the holiday season can actually be extremely difficult. And so if you're feeling that way, especially as we take a little bit of a break from organized services or house church, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we care for you, we care for each other, we wanna be here to support each other. So don't hesitate to reach out if you're like, this is actually a really hard season for me and I just really need someone to talk to. We'd be more than happy as staff to help out with that or connect you with somebody else from the community that'd be more than willing to sit down, chat and be a friend in a time when things can be difficult. If you need to get a hold of someone and you need their number, um, you can always reach out to myself um, you can reach out to our staff and we can make sure that you have a way of connecting with the person you're trying to get a hold of. So don't feel like you can't connect with people. If anything, embrace the invitation to take a step forward and make the first move in connecting with people and extending an invitation out. Okay, I want to dive into today's topic. We are diving into part three of the Rooted and Gifted series. I've personally just really enjoyed hearing the different um, experiences people have had with the Holy Spirit. Last week, I really enjoyed how we discussed what it looks like for us to be connected to the Father. And so I actually want to start things off by setting us into house churches right away and help us reflect on some of the content we've already received. Um, we're here to learn, and learning is something that is supposed to be active, not passive. And so more than just gaining a whole bunch of knowledge, we want to apply this knowledge or take steps, start making an effort to figure out how we can live out what we're learning. Two weeks ago, we talked about the Father and the Holy Spirit. We saw how Jesus talks a lot about His Father and the Holy Spirit. We talked about access to the Father, about how that's a gift to us because of Jesus. We talked about the Holy Spirit, about how that's a gift given to us through Jesus and because of Jesus. In our house church session two weeks ago, we had a handout and we spent some time discussing the following question. How is God inviting you to engage with the Father and the Holy Spirit? And I'm curious how that went. How did you take the knowledge that you received how did you take what was discussed in the home and then try to apply it? I know for a lot of us, what we said is, I need to spend more time with Jesus. I need to spend more time with the Father, talking to the Father. 
we talked about making sure we set aside time or scheduled time for prayer. That, that was my thing is I felt like maybe I need to actually put a block in my calendar that says this is time for me and God, me and Jesus. It's one of those things where I'm like, that should be a priority, but then I don't necessarily schedule it in. And so it's supposed to somehow make its way in. And that doesn't always happen. And so my thing was like, okay, I think God is saying for me to engage with the Father and hear from the Holy Spirit, I actually need to make this practical and schedule it in. And those others that felt similar. What was your thing that you communicated to the group two weeks ago? What's the thing that you felt God put in your heart when you asked yourself the question, how do I engage with the Father and the Holy Spirit? And how did that go? This question is really intended to help us be focused on obedience-based discipleship, to take what we're learning and then step out in obedience. However, it's not intended to create shame. And so if you didn't have a chance to actually follow through with what you mentioned, that's okay. This is another opportunity to remind yourself to focus on that in the next coming weeks. Um, it's also possible that you weren't a part of the last discussion, which is totally okay. Maybe this is your first time attending a house church or joining us, or your first time to engage with the series. Um, in that case, um, hear from people what they're sharing, and then maybe use that to reflect on your own life as well. Uh, you didn't have the benefit on having two weeks to think about this or try and live this out. But maybe ask yourself the question, how is God inviting me to live this out over the next two weeks? But take a moment in your house church, discuss, what did you voice? How did that go? How did you live that out? What was that like? And then we'll dive into some of our content.
So in part one and part two of our series, we spent a lot of time talking about being rooted in Jesus. And that was very intentional. We said if we want to focus on using our gifts, then we need to understand where those gifts come from. And they come from Jesus. They're given to us through the Holy Spirit. They're given to us because of the love and the grace of the Father. And so we spent a lot of time talking about what it looks like to remain in Jesus, like he describes here in John 15. Jesus says that he's the true grapevine. Um, in verse 1, he says, I am the true grapevine and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. And so we were exploring this idea of like, what does it look like for God to prune me so I could produce even more fruit? And then in verse 3 says, You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So we've been exploring this idea of what does it look like to remain in Jesus? We looked at the context of John 15 and we saw how um, this is in the middle of some teaching or some conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples right before he gets arrested. He's had his last supper with them and then he gives them this farewell speech, teaches them a little bit, and then he's about to get arrested. Today, I slowly want us to shift now to talk a little more about the gifts. We have two more weeks in the series, today and two weeks from now. And so I want us to spend some time talking about these gifts and slowly lead us to a place where we can start to understand what it looks like for us to use these gifts. However, before we do that, we need to look at John 17. So like I mentioned, these chapters between John 14 and 17 is Jesus teaching his disciples right before he gets arrested. John 17 is special because after Jesus teaches his disciples, he now prays for them. So I'm going to read this through. This is going to be a long passage. Hang on tight. Make sure you pull this up. If you have your Bible, it's going to be up on the screen as well. Um, but lean in. Lean into what Jesus is saying here. Pay attention to the words he's speaking. And then pay attention to his posture. Pay attention to his heart. What is his heart communicating here? What's the main message he's trying to communicate in this prayer? After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. I have revealed you to the ones you gave me from this world. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you, for I passed on to them the message you gave me. They accepted it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. 
all who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me so they bring me glory now i am departing from the world they're staying in this world but i am coming to you holy father you have given me your name now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are during my time here i protected them by the power of the name you gave me I guarded them so that not one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now, I am coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. I am praying not only for these disciples, and again, he was praying for the disciples in the room with him, but he says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. We could go through each verse here and break it apart. And maybe at some point we'll do that. But I want you to pay attention to for just a quick moment here is the consistent message that Jesus is communicating as he prays to God. As he prays for us, as Jesus is praying for you, here's what he says. He says, God, I have completed. Father, I have completed the work you gave me. I revealed you to these disciples. They have experienced you, Father. So I'm asking that you protect them and I'm sending them out into the world now to reveal you to the rest of the world. Jesus here is very clear about the fact that like, this is not just for the disciples that are in the room with him. This is for everybody that will hear the message of the gospel. His desire is that we would be united with the Father. Two weeks ago, we talked about how our entire lives are meant to be viewed through the lens of Jesus. What does it look like to view our entire lives through the lens of salvation? If you've ever been around, you know, young children, I think maybe somewhere around the age of like three, four, five, uh, you notice they ask a lot of questions and they'll ask why a lot, right? It's why, it's why, it's why. They keep asking why over and over and over again because they're curious and they're learning. And I think it's worth taking that same approach sometimes when we're reading scripture, understanding scripture and trying to discover the heart of Jesus and trying to discover the heart of God. Why? I think even beyond that, I think it's worth asking why about the things that we do in life. Like, why is it important for us to be good? Why is it important for us to love each other? Why should we care for one another? Why do you parent? Um, why do you involve yourself in relationships and friendships with people? What is the purpose of our existence? Why do we exist? What are we created for? I think if you believe that God is our ultimate creator, then you have to believe that he has created us, created you for a specific design and specific purpose. And we see how that plays out differently in each one of our lives. We don't all do the same things, but we all have a specific purpose it seems like we're created for, and we discover that along the way. But we have this shared purpose of pointing people towards God. And today, what I think I want to say is our entire purpose can be summed up as to point people towards salvation. Everything we do is meant to lead people to salvation. If I am a Jesus follower, then 
everything I do is motivated by salvation. If salvation is the most important thing that's happened in my life, then everything I do after experiencing salvation has to lead people to that. There's ways that this can be done in a healthy way that actually helps people see the heart of God. And then there's times where this is done in an unhealthy way, right? Like if your only motive for talking to a friend is so that you can like eventually be like, oh, I want to lead you to Jesus. If that's not done in a you know, healthy way, if you don't actually care about the person, you're just thinking, how can I make sure that like another number that I lead to Jesus, that's not going to work out right. But if you operate from a place of love and approach friendships and community from the heart of God and the heart of Jesus, it will naturally allow our lives to be something that points towards God, which should lead to salvation. And so in a moment, we're going to talk about the gifts, but the gifts that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 are actually intended to point us towards salvation. So the question for us right now in House Church, before we dive into the gifts, is what does it look like for your entire life to point people towards salvation? The only thing we can actually rely on, the only thing we can really count on is the salvation that God provides. People will let us down. People have let us down. That will continue to happen. And we can't predict that everything's going to work out perfectly in our lives. We're going to experience suffering. You might be experiencing suffering right now. The only thing you can really count on to be true is that salvation is our only hope. We get to experience the comfort of Jesus in suffering, but the only reason we get to experience that is because we have been saved, because we've experienced salvation. And so today we could maybe view salvation as being reunited and restored into relationship with the Father. In John 17 here, Jesus is very clear that that's what he came to do, is to reveal the Father and to unite us with the Father. To be saved, to experience salvation, is to have a restored relationship with the Father, is to have the sin in our lives be forgiven and wiped clean because of what Jesus on the, did on the cross so that we can be with the Father again. It's to be made holy, to be made righteous, so that we can have relationship with the Father. Salvation is our only hope and it's the only thing we can lean on. It's the only thing that will not let us down in this life and beyond this life. Why is salvation our only hope? I want you to discuss that in your house churches. I want you to share what you understand from scripture. If you have to jump to a few different scriptures, do that as a group. I want you to chat from your personal experience. What has salvation done for you in your life? Have you experienced salvation? Why did you feel like you needed to experience God's salvation? And why is that our only hope? After that, we'll dive into the gifts.
In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, let me help you address the problems that you're experiencing. Here's a guide to the problems that you're experiencing. And to every problem that's happening in the church in Corinth that was being communicated to Paul at the time, he basically communicates, view this through the gospel. View this through the lens of Jesus. View this through the lens of salvation. In 1 Corinthians 12, when he's talking about the spiritual gifts, he addresses a problem where people were so focused on the expressions of the gifts God had given as opposed to where they came from. Let's, let's look at what Paul has to say here. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. I want us to focus on just those first few um, six verses for just a moment. What Paul is communicating here, first off, is that there are special gifts and abilities given to people that believe in Jesus. So that means if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have experienced salvation, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you and you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talked about how our entire purpose, our entire lives, our ultimate purpose is meant to point people toward God. It's meant to point people towards salvation. And Jesus didn't just leave us hanging on how we do that. He said, follow my example, and then beyond that, live by the power of the Holy Spirit so you can point people towards something supernatural and something divine. I will give you what you need to lead people towards God. And that's what ministry is. Ministry in its simplest form is helping guide people towards God, towards connection with God. And the idea of ministry is something that God intended for the entire church, for every single believer, irregardless of age, 
irregardless of your background or past, irregardless of where you are right now. God's intention, Jesus' intention, is that everybody is involved in ministry, right? And often you just hear that term with, you know, leaders in a church or pastors, but God's design for the church is everybody is involved in ministry. Everybody's involved in guiding people towards God. And so ministry can look really different. There's different ways to minister. It can look like teaching, and Paul here describes different gifts. It can look like caring for somebody. It can look like helping someone practically. Ministry can look really different. But what's important to understand, first off, is that you are called to ministry. You have a calling on your life to ministry if you are a Jesus follower. And so what we need to explore as believers today, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is what does it look like for me to use the gifts God has given to me and placed inside of me for ministry? He placed them there so I could minister. So what does it look like for me to minister using the gifts that God has given me? And so there's three things I think are really key for us to explore today. Number one, who are the gifts for? And that is for us as believers. So you have a gift. We have gifts. Individually, we have spiritual gifts given to us. There's a variety here that are listed. What's important for us is to figure out how God is calling us to use those gifts. These gifts are a result of believing in Jesus and experiencing salvation. And number two, where do the gifts come from? They come from God, from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then number three, why are we given these gifts? And what Paul is presenting here is that the purpose of these gifts is to help each other, to help each other. As we minister to one another, by doing that, we point towards God. It is because of the salvation we've experienced that we can actually help each other and lead others back to a place where they see God. It is important for every single one of us to identify the gifts given to us. Those gifts can change. In one season of life, you might actually need to use this spiritual gift. And then in a different season, God's like, I actually want to use this. And maybe not even in different seasons, like it could be just like with different people, right? Like with this person, you feel like, oh, God's asking me to use this gift right now. He's equipping me through the Holy Spirit and enabling me through the Holy Spirit to use this specific spiritual gift. And then with a different person, he's actually giving you something else. Another thing to make note of here is there's different gifts, but it's possible for you and I, it's possible for you and somebody else to have similar gifts, but God is asking you to use them differently. So an example is like you might have the gift of teaching, and that might be with teaching kids. And then you might have the gift of teaching adults or teens. It's the same gift, but a different application. You might have the gift of teaching for like crowds of people. But you might have the gift of teaching just like two, three people in your life. You might have the gift of teaching just in a small group. And so what we want to avoid is number one, comparing each other's gifts as if one is more important than the other. That's what was happening in the church of Corinth. The problem that the church of Corinth was facing is people thought this gift is more important. And so if I have it, I am superior to you. And then people started chasing the ones that they thought are more important. And Paul describes here, even in the later verses, that we are one body and we need each other. So don't compare your gifts in a negative way. We need each other. The other thing you need to make note of is you have this gift as a loan from God. The word that Paul uses for gifts at one point here is charisma. And basically, charisma means a gift given freely out of grace. Like we think of that word purely just for like someone that's gifted with the you know, gift of speech. But charisma is basically any gift you receive from God that's given freely out of grace. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You did not earn your way into the spiritual gift. I found it interesting that oftentimes the most humble people don't talk about how humble they are. If you have to brag about how humble you are, you're not actually that humble. The most generous people don't showcase how generous they are because to be generous means you give freely without needing uh, praise 
or recognition for what you're giving. You just give purely because God is leading you to do that. And the most generous people I've found in my life don't talk about how much they give. It's this interesting thing where if you have to talk so much about what you are and the quality that you have, then it might be an indication that maybe you actually don't possess fully what you think you actually have. This is the problem the Pharisees had, is the Pharisees portrayed all the time how holy they were. When Jesus was teaching about prayer, he called out the Pharisees. They would like go on the corner of the street and portray how loud they can pray and how well they can pray. And Jesus came along and said, your father is not impressed by that. Don't do that. Instead, pray in secret where only God can see you. If I have to tell you how holy I am, then perhaps I'm really not as holy as I think I really am. Everything given to us that is meant to serve others, generosity, humility, holiness, righteousness, is given to us because of God's grace. There's nothing we did to earn or deserve it, which is why we can't boast about it. If anything, we're supposed to recognize that these things are given to us so we can continue to learn and grow. I find the people I'm really, really drawn towards that I really want to learn from are people that are always learning. I'm not sure if you guys remember um, Alan and Susie. They were a part of our New City community for quite a while. And I miss them. What I really love about Alan and Susie is they are experienced leaders. I mean, they've been running some incredible ministries. And every time I chat with Alan specifically, he never flaunted how much he's done or what he's accomplished, even though he's accomplished some really great things. And anytime I had questions about church and ministry and I was trying to process things, he always came with the perspective of like, here's what I'm learning, here's what I'm trying to learn, and then I'm also able to learn from what he's learning. And I think it's fascinating that the people that sometimes have the greatest impact are those that are always willing to learn and always willing to grow and not so focused on themselves and what they have or their gifts, but more focused on how they can learn and how they use those gifts to serve others. And I think that's the posture that Paul's calling us into here today, is take these gifts, understand they're for you as a believer, they come from God, but the reason you use them is to help others and point people towards salvation, not to point towards yourself. It's a trap that we can so easily fall into is thinking these gifts are meant to actually serve me. But we see how Jesus said that the Son of God, Jesus came to serve, not to be served. And where the church of Corinth went wrong is because they were focusing on serving themselves and flaunting how well they were either speaking in tongues or doing this or doing that. Because they were doing that, they were actually causing division which caused them to actually go further into other problems that is described in other chapters in 1 Corinthians. He says, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're looking at yourselves, and now you're actually trying to glorify the flesh as opposed to trying to glorify God and point people towards God. So use those gifts to serve people so they can point towards God and not towards yourself. And so if you have to communicate to yeah, the people around you or your church community, if you feel like you have to communicate, I have this gift, I have this gift, I should be using it. My proposition to you is to sit down and reflect, is God actually inviting you to learn how to use that gift? Is God actually encouraging you to focus on what the purpose of that gift is as opposed to seeking out um, a sense of like, I should be using this gift? How is God inviting you to focus on others as opposed to yourself? And as we do that, as we focus on others, we become more equipped to serve well. We use our gifts well. What I'd like for us to do is to reflect on the gifts in our life. What are the gifts God has given you? Now, what we're not going to do this time around, um, we might do this at a different point, I'm not sure. But this time around, I feel like we're not going to have um, some kind of worksheet for you to work through to try and figure out what your gift is. That can be helpful too, but that's not what we're using today. Here's what I'd like for us to do today. I'd like for you to take a moment and ask God, what are the spiritual gifts you have given me? Maybe for this season of life, maybe in the past, what are the gifts you have given me? I want you to ask God, but one of the ways I want you to hear from God today is through the community that he's placed around you. And so what we're going to do in our house churches right now is we're gonna go through each person in the room, each person in the house church discussion, 
And I want you as a community, as a house church, to take some time and think and pray. Take like one minute to think and pray for each person, maybe two minutes. Think and pray for each person. And say, God, what are the gifts that I identify in this person? What are the gifts that I see in the people in my community? And you want to go through this slowly. You want to take your time to do this. Take like two minutes and think for one person and then share. Share what you think you see in them. This could even be based on what you've experienced from them in your life. Right? Like we were shooting a 519 project earlier this year from Mike Clausen. And um, the team that puts together the 519 project, absolutely incredible team. But it became even more incredible um, when we were filming for Mike because of Russell. Right? So this was like the new addition to our team. And Russell's role on the team was to make sure that we all had snacks, <laughs> to make sure we all stayed fed. He was running for food. If we ever needed any help in any way, Russell was there to like care for us. Beyond just like, how can we film something? Russell was like, how do I care for the people putting this project together? And Russell did a phenomenal job, right? We were calling him the MVP of the 519 team after that. And you could ask any member of the 519 team, that is true. So much so that if we're ever doing another 519 project and Russell can't be involved, none of us want to be involved. This guy has this gift of being able to care for others so selflessly and to do it so well. And it's incredible to watch, Russell, it's incredible to watch you operate in that and do that not just in that space, but in every space that you're in to care so selflessly for the needs of others before you actually care for your own. That's a beautiful thing. That's what the spiritual gifts are intended to do. As Russell cares for others, he's actually pointing towards a God that loves deeply and provided salvation. And Russell's motive for caring for others goes beyond just wanting to be a good person, but it goes way deeper than that. It's actually the way he was designed and it's what he's received from God. Take time and do a similar thing in your house church. Look at what you've experienced from the people in your life in this community and call out the gifts that you see God has given them, the spiritual gifts God has given them. This is maybe slightly different from being able to sing well. This is maybe slightly different from being able to use a hammer well. Those are gifts as well, but those are like natural gifts. Those are gifts that an unbeliever can have as well. What are the spiritual gifts that you see in someone that help point you and others towards salvation. So think, pray for that one person for like two minutes, share, and then move on to the next person and go through each person in the room. It is more important that you go through each person in the room. So house church leader is going to manage that, make sure the timing is right, but don't skip this. We need to identify how God is calling us to minister to one another and point people to its salvation. And today, it could be awesome to hear from each other and hear God through that. So dive into that, and then we'll wrap things up.
I hope as you were um, hearing from people in the room, I hope you're able to hear God speaking through the people in the room. I think it's important to recognize that God will help us hear Him and see what He's seeing through the people around us. It's possible that you have spiritual gifts right now that God is calling to use that maybe weren't mentioned in the room though. And so don't limit what God is calling to you just to what was spoken here. Take what you heard and then sit with it over the next two weeks, sit with it and say, God, how does this line up in my life? Do I see you asking me to use this gift here or use this gift there? And then there's maybe gifts that you know about that God has spoken to you that you haven't used yet or people haven't seen you use yet, but that God is preparing you to use. Those are valid as well. Don't limit how God can reveal to you what the gifts are He's given to you. If you aren't sure of your spiritual gifts, try out different things. And if you can do that within a community of people that love you and care about you and will help you stay focused on Jesus, then you can have a really good setup. Try out different things. See where there's different needs in the church. If you're like, man, I think I see a need here for like encouraging people, try it out and see if that's something that brings you joy and if it's something that you feel like God is equipping you to do. See where there's a need, try and fill the gap, and see if God is possibly calling you to operate in a spiritual gift or use a spiritual gift there. If you're like, man, I just really see that I need to like speak a word of knowledge into someone's life, then try it out. Do it with humility, understanding that God gives the gifts and He empowers the gifts. Ultimately, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables these gifts to have an impact in our lives and the people around us. So trust the power of the Holy Spirit, trust God, and then trust the process of exploring different things. If you are unsure of how to go about that, bring questions to the table, bring questions to your house church, bring questions to myself, ask questions and we can figure it out together and explore together. There's other people that maybe have had other experiences of using similar gifts or using different gifts but have been through a similar process and you can learn from that. But don't be afraid to step out, to take a step forward and start to practice exercising different spiritual gifts. One of the ways that we see this happening for us as a church is through the support team that we're hoping to build. We've been talking about this for the last few weeks. A support team is a group of people that are intended to help us function in the way that God designed us to function as a church, to help us serve each other, to equip those that are called to heal the sick, to equip those that are called to teach, to equip those that are called to evangelize, to equip those that are called to acts of service. What does it look like for us to support each other so that the church community and the body is functioning in the way that God designed? And so we're looking for two to three people to focus on teaching to help us walk through series, to talk through content 
But even more importantly, we're looking for people on that team to equip others to share and teach in their own ways. That could be through conversations, that could be through sharing like a testimony. Maybe it's just like teaching people how to have conversations every day, one-on-one -on -one with people in their workplace. The teaching team is there to help and equip us and also to do some teaching. Then we're looking for like two to three people that are focused on community. Uh, this team is intended, this is a big team and community is a big thing, but the focus of this team is to help us identify needs within the community and then find ways that we can meet those needs. So if there's a need here for something, who do we know within the community that could possibly help with that or possibly even outside the community? How can we be a resource? How can we create spaces where we build relationships with one another? That's a big part of the community team is developing relationships, creating space for us to develop relationships, providing resources, providing support as we build relationships with one another. So that includes like working on things like putting together our collective gathering and the different aspects of the collective gathering. It's going to involve things to do with house church. It's going to involve things to do with like special events. There's so much in there. And this is what the body, the church is called to do and the support team just helps us with that. Then we're looking for two to three people to help us with missional living. The idea there is what does it look like to live missionally? Uh, to be a disciple, is to be mission-minded all the time in our everyday life, not just when we go away somewhere. And so God might be calling us to travel somewhere to um, share the heart of God with people, and that's great. And then other times He's asking us to just do that in our everyday life. But He's calling us to do that all the time. So what does that look like in our lives to live missionally? And then we're looking for two to three people to help with finances, to help run fundraisers, come up with ideas for fundraisers, recruit people, empower people to do our fundraisers. And then lastly, we're looking for two to three people that will help us focus on some of the um, human relations. There's going to be um, inevitable conflict and tension that comes up as we work on different things. There's different things we'll have to keep an eye out for, right? Like as we work on different things, we have to pay attention to this. A good example is like, right now we need, um, there's a need for something within our kids program to make sure that you know, everyone that's helping out and serving kids is equipped and is protecting our kids well. That's something that the team uh, focused on HR human relations would kind of focus on and figure out things we could implement and offer advice and bring things to the table and say, hey, as a community, do you think this would be helpful? And then we could make decisions from there. These are five different areas that we think are core to who we are. We think they're core to the ministry that we do. And we think they're actually core to helping us equip each other to point people towards salvation. The motive for the support team is not success. The motive for the support team is not to have some kind of business structure. The motive for the support team is ministry for the purpose of pointing people towards salvation. And so I ask you to reflect on that as well. Like, what does that look like in your life? Do you feel like you're engaging with any of those areas outside of this new city community space? And you feel like God is calling you to continue to do that? Is he asking you to possibly find ways to do that within this new city team? Um, if you are interested in being a part of the support team, please reach out to me. Um, and if you just like have questions about the team and you wanna hear more, I would love to sit down with you and walk you through each team and dive into the specifics of each team and maybe see where God is calling you. There's no pressure, but this is something we need as a church in order for us to continue to function well and to do even greater things. Where we are right now is great, but God is calling us even further, even deeper, and He's calling us to have even more impact. In order for that to happen, we have to do this together. It can't rest on just one person or a couple of people or just a few people on a staff team. It needs to be us as a body functioning and ministering. So if you feel called or interested in talking about the support team, please reach out to me. I would love to schedule some time to sit down with you and talk with you. Beyond that, ask God how he's asking you to use the spiritual gifts in your everyday life. Thank you so much for joining us for this part three. Um, I hope the rest of your time together in house church is beneficial and fruitful. And I hope you actually make some good 
connection with the people around you. See you next week at the Christmas party and then at House Church two weeks from now.